From United Nations headquarters in New York, this is World Chronicle. World Chronicle, a spontaneous, unrehearsed, unedited interview with a senior official whose work is concerned with the developing nations of the world. Today's guest, attending a special session of the United Nations, is the President of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Ziaur Rehman. I hope that the food aid by other countries uh, will not be affected as a result of this. Uh, uh, this is the time where we need support because we are trying to pick up and stand on our feet and this is the time that uh, our friendly countries got to come forward and give us a helping hand. In a moment, additional views, opinions and answers to reporters' questions from today's guest on World Chronicle, which is presented by United Nations Radio and Television in cooperation with the UN's Division for Economic and Social Information. Here now is the program host, news correspondent of the British Broadcasting Corporation, Brian E. Saxton. Hello and welcome back to another edition of World Chronicle. And here at the United Nations headquarters in New York today to interview our guest are three news correspondents. Brennan Jones, correspondent for Interpress Service, the Third World News Agency. Peggy Wilkins of the international staff of the Wall Street Journal. And Prem Shankar Yar, editor, Financial Express, New Delhi. Our guest today, Zia Rahman, the President of Bangladesh, was born in 1936. He became a professional soldier at the age of 17 when he joined the Army of Pakistan. In 1971, General Zia Rahman led the uprising against Pakistan, which resulted in the independence of East Pakistan and the establishment of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. Following the change of government in 1975, Zayar Rahman was appointed deputy and later became chief, martial law administrator of Bangladesh. In 1978, Bangladesh held its first ever presidential election, and Zayar Rahman was elected to office by defeating his nearest rival by some 11 million votes. President Zayar, we're delighted to have you on this edition of World Chronicle, and here with our first question for you is Mr. Jar of the Financial Express in New Delhi. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the question I have to ask you today concerns your statement this morning to the General Assembly where, if you'll pardon me using the, the phrase, you, you dropped a small bombshell as far as the group of 77 were concerned. In fact, someone listening to you said that it's rather like the chap who told the king that he had no clothes on. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to your suggestion that the OPEC countries should cut the price of oil to the developing countries by 50%. Now from what I've been seeing, a number of people have this very much on their minds, but the group of 77 were hoping, rather hoping, to keep this within the ECDC, the Economic Cooperation for Developing Countries, and not to air it here. Now, what were your reasons for doing this, and how have you been received? Well, uh, that's for you to judge uh, how uh, I have been received, as far as this is concerned. But uh, uh, countries like ours, uh, the least developed countries are really badly affected as a result of the general inflation all over the world and the rise in oil price. On the one hand, uh, we are paying far too much price for oil and on, on the other hand, we are having to get from the developed countries uh, uh, finished products uh, at higher and higher price. So on the one hand, we are having to pay a much higher bill for oil, and on the other hand, we are having to pay much higher bill for imported products. This has put us off uh, very badly. So we have to find out ways and means by which uh, we can uh, balance up uh, this maladjustment. And it is uh, with this uh, objective that I suggested that the uh, OPEC countries uh, should think of uh, supplying oil uh, at uh, that price level to the least developed countries. Well, the point is, I think they had rather hoped, if I'm not mistaken, that they would avoid the separation or the isolation of the oil issue or the oil price issue from the other issues of uh, how to recycle in, in the international liquidity, changes in the representation of various countries on the board of, uh, board of governors of IMF and World Bank, and other issues which are structural in, nat in nature. Now, you, your statement seems to have gone against this trend inside the group of states. Would you agree with, with me on that? I don't think so. These are all interconnected. The price of oil has direct bearing 
on all other issues related to economy and especially to the developing and least developed countries. So I think this is right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask you about the commodity agreements. Uh, does Bangladesh uh, stand to gain from those? And what do you think of the prospects for coming to some commodity agreements uh, out of the UN session? Uh, would you just uh, clearly uh, say what you would like to know? Okay, the agreements that would stabilize prices of commodities. And I assume that you would benefit through jute uh, for your jute and for your tea, perhaps other commodities. Um, can you comment on what the United Nations uh, is, is about to do in terms of, of stabilizing commodity prices and how Bangladesh could benefit? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this uh, is again very important for us. Uh, Because uh, we find that for our raw products, uh, countries like us uh, are mainly exporting raw material. And for this, unfortunately, we are getting lesser price or not attractive price. So this has uh, decreased our uh, uh, exports in real value. So if uh, an agreement like this is reached uh, through negotiations and understanding, it is going to help uh, countries like ours uh, reasonably well mm -hmm. and keep our export balanced. And we can see beforehand and know how much uh, we can earn from our exports. This will help us in planning our uh, production in the country and our export uh, over a period of substantial time. And specifically, the, your, your exports that would uh, benefit would be jute, uh, tea? Yes, jute, tea, leather. Leather, yeah. yeah. What do you think the prospects are for, uh, for an agreement that will, that will benefit the countries? Well, uh, as I said uh, this morning, uh -huh. it's not an easy thing. But we got to keep uh, moving with the negotiations and uh, find out new formulas uh, which could be acceptable to all the parties and especially formulas which will in real time benefit uh, countries like ours. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would like to say one thing and that is uh, that uh, uh, countries, some of the countries like ours have uh, a lot of untapped resources, unexplored resources, unutilized resources, uh, natural resources. For our country, we can <coughs> say, um, such as the gas, natural gas, good prospect for oil, uh, limestone, coal, which have remained uh, unexplored or fully developed. So. Um, in this way, uh, we would be able to uh, foresee our exports uh, and plan our economy. Mr. President, I'd like to get back to the question about the bombshell that you dropped this morning. Uh, the talk in the corridors of the UN and amongst many delegates is that we might see a split here in the, in the Group of 77. Uh, are you thinking of, of trying to take leadership and forming a least developed country bloc to try and move away a coalition of some sort to deal specifically with your set of problems? And the other question I'd like to ask is, uh, it was hinted by U.S. Ambassador McHenry what the content of your speech would be and that we should watch it closely. Uh, were you con uh, consulting with the U.S. government on this, and was there any kind of deal that was struck? Uh, the uh, question, uh, answer to your first question is uh, that there is nothing like that. Uh, this is a <coughs> thing uh, which have been, uh, I understand, uh, mentioned by others earlier. And uh, we felt that uh, it is uh, better to say it here. And I don't think this has any prospect of uh, splitting the group of 77. And uh, let me tell you, uh, we had uh, no talks with anybody on this count. If anybody said, must have said on their own. 
but then how did uh, Ambassador McHenry say with great, great confidence? He said, I don't want to uh, steal the thunder of President Zia, who will be talking to you a little later. But um, you should listen to the speech being given by the President of Bangladesh <coughs> and what he has to say about the en energy question and the price of oil. I'm just quoting him. Well, I think you should ask him to answer this question. He must have good intelligence. <laughs> I'd like to refer to a very interesting magazine yeah. article recently, sir. Uh, which described you as being the super salesman from Dhaka, taking the message around the world that Bangladesh has a stable government and is emerging as an attractive trading partner for both East and West. Did you see that? And if you didn't, how would you react to that? Well, I don't know, but uh, during the last one or two years, I have undertaken trips to really many countries, both in the East and the West. Uh, the object, uh, one should have understood that. Uh, uh, we were colonized for a long period, as a result of which you remain undeveloped, whereas uh, we have tremendous resources. Firstly, the land is so fertile and uh, our, in agriculture our return is so low. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, we have several others uh, uh, very uh, valuable natural resources which have remained undeveloped, unexplored. For this, uh, we got to uh, talk to people who have the money, who have the technical know-how. Uh, apart from this, uh, being a new country, I had uh, decided to visit as many countries as possible. And I think these uh, visits have really helped us a lot uh, to project Bangladesh in other countries and uh, discuss with those countries' leaders as to how uh, economic cooperation could be built up uh, and as a result of these visits uh, our assistance from abroad uh, has increased over the last two, three years and the uh, economy in our country <laughs> are gradually picking up. Um, may I come to a related question to this one which is uh, the one of uh, shall we say, regional cooperation. Uh, one of the problems that we all face in common is, in fact, uh, the, the oil price, if you like, the balance of payments problem. And uh, it seems to me that the best thing what could possibly do is try and uh, the countries most affected, uh, least developed, most seriously affected, doesn't really matter which, uh, that we should try and buy as much from each other and possibly try for better terms. Now, uh, for instance, all the four countries of the subcontinent have an interest in tea, in jute, in leather, uh, and um, textiles to a large extent, uh -huh. and uh, it, the, at the same time, at least one of the countries, which is India, is producing many of the, uh, the, the products that, that you would need, for example, cement or textile machinery, at very, very much lower than world prices. Now, how, what is anything being done? Uh, are you thinking of something towards regional cooperation, uh, or is it all snagged up on big issues like the Faraka barrage and, and things like that? You see, you are aware that a few months ago, Bangladesh uh, proposed a forum on the basis of uh, South Asian countries. And this has been well received by the various countries of uh, South Asia region. And the object is that uh, through this forum, we could uh, do many things which will benefit uh, the region as a whole. and. Uh, under that forum, trade, commerce, and other bilateral relations, uh, regional relations, regional matters could be discussed, as in case of other regional forums. I'd like to ask, pursue a question on the issue of food aid, which is certainly an issue in the United States where this can be seen. Uh, there's an awful lot of solid documentation that has come up that uh, perhaps too much food aid is going into. Uh, Bangladesh that recently the British government curtailed government to government aid because of what they saw as some of the abuses there that the rationing program tends to go to the urban population and to civil service workers and that it's had a negative effect on agricultural production because of it's a disincentive to the producer uh, how do you respond to those criticisms and, and what really is being done? Right. Uh, let me tell you that uh, in 19, up to 1950, our country then, East Pakistan, was self-sufficient in food. And thereafter, uh, till recently, uh, in 
the agriculture sector, not much was done. As a result, with the growth of the population, the requirement of the food went up, but the food production remained low. Uh, now, <coughs> we have rationing system in our country, which is coming over since a long period. Now, the uh, object of our government is to gradually get rid of this rationing system, which is mainly concentrated in the uh, uh, urban areas, but we are trying to sort of distribute more and more in the rural areas. And lately, we have started open market <coughs> operation, whereby at a certain price we sell out in the markets uh, rice and wheat to keep the uh, market price steady. At the same time, we have undertaken uh, special measures to procure a lot of food grains and uh, right now we have 1.2 million roughly food stock uh, with the government. Uh, we are giving a lot of encouragement to the farmers uh, by price support and in future we are going to do a lot more. The object is ourselves to become self-sufficient food so that you don't have to get really food uh, from abroad. It's not a good thing. But realistically you are going to need additional food aid for the next several years and, and what is the uh, impact can, of the British government curtailing? I'm coming to that point. point. Uh, let me tell you that uh, we shall be self-sufficient in food earlier than anybody thinks and we have taken certain measures uh, on that count and we are beginning to get the results. Uh, as far as... When do you uh, expect food self-sufficiency? Uh, I think uh, in the next uh, two, three years time mm -hmm. or maybe uh, a little more, maybe a little less, because we have uh, launched a sort of a special uh, program on this count and we have got very good results and the next one year will give very solid indication about it. Our objective is not to become self-sufficient alone, but uh, uh, we are going for doubling food production in the next five, six years time from now. For this, uh, we are mobilizing the people to take to voluntary work for uh, uh, re-excavating the silted up canals and rivers you know, with a view to doing irrigation, bringing more and more land under irrigation. And in the last winter, we did massive work on this count and through voluntary means uh, we brought more than 600,000 acres of land under irrigation, virtually at no cost. And uh, next winter, which is our dry season, uh, we are going to undertake uh, three times more than this work. That means we will try about 1.5 million acres to be brought additional under irrigation by unconventional method. So this is a great effort that is coming up in our country. And uh, I hope this question will not arise very, uh, very much in the near future. And do you think the British action will affect, <coughs> well, the U.S. Uh, food aid program? Uh, well, uh, Britain has uh, reduced uh, the food aid uh, as compared to before uh, because of certain other reasons also. Uh, uh, but uh, I hope that the food aid by other countries uh, will not be affected as a result of this. Uh, uh, this is the time where we need support because we are trying to pick up and stand on our feet. And this is the time that uh, our friendly countries got to come forward and give us a helping hand in a big way. Perhaps on that we move into, I think, uh, into another area which is uh, very much in the news these days, Islamic solidarity. As you know, Bangladesh talks constantly of the need for increased solidarity. So I think we, we do have to ask you the question, how do you view recent events in Afghanistan and Iran as being a potential threat to that solidarity? Well, <coughs> uh, the Islamic solidarity uh, is building up uh, and... Uh, well, uh, I hope uh, with, uh, in the near future uh, we shall be able to overcome these uh, problems uh, through uh, uh, various measures uh, and uh, I strongly feel that the Islamic solidarity is going to become stronger and stronger in future. But does the present situation in those two specific countries right now concern you deeply? 
It does concern, but uh, I don't think Islamic solidarity as such is affected uh, as a result of these two. May I ask you something on this? The, uh, the Islamic bomb, the nuclear bomb being so-called constructed in, 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 in Pakistan, uh, how do you feel about this? I'm, I would be rather ambivalent about this. Here's a country that <coughs> you fought to liberate yourself from a few years ago and which is building a bomb, uh, which is allegedly an Islamic bomb, and you are most certainly a part of the Islamic uh, group of countries. Um, well, what would you feel about this? Well, uh, I know as much as you know, and uh, I understand that they are not making any bomb. Well, I hope, I hope that's so, sir. <laughs> you this is better information. <laughs> But this, this question of Islam, yeah. which you know is very high in, the, in, in everybody's minds these days, uh, that uh, Islam is in the throes of some kind of renaissance, some change. Um, and there's been an unusually strong emphasis being placed on Islamic solidarity. We're back to this continuous phrase which keeps making the headlines. Isn't there the danger perhaps that this kind of policy might be regarded as a, a sort of isolationist policy? Mm, from what? From getting away to that old Islamic concept of greater cooperation and contact between nations. I don't think uh, this will affect that. The, um, I, I wonder if, I have, no please, after. Are you said on the same line? Please, please, <laughs> if we have in, our, in, our, in yeah, a few right. minutes left, okay. I'd love to pursue yeah. this because it is okay. a terribly mm -hmm. interesting. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, a little more about Afghanistan and um, your reaction to the, pr the problem there and how you feel, what can be done, I mean, what would you like to see? In, in well, I think uh, we, our position on Afghanistan is quite clear and uh, we feel that the foreign troops from Afghanistan should be withdrawn and the people of Afghanistan should be left uh, on their own to choose their system, political and economic. Well, I think the obvious other question is Iran. Uh, I think uh, your foreign minister in Islamabad uh, in July did say that he thought the situation in Iran was a threat to regional security. And I think there was the idea of uh, setting up a contact group to help solve that problem. What has been the latest news on that? Well, uh, I precisely don't know, but I think they are making all efforts uh, to work out some uh, understanding with uh, the present uh, Afghan uh, uh, people or government, I don't understand. Uh, I don't have the exact information, but they are approaching in various ways uh, to realize their objective. My question gets back to, to what the UN is doing here in the special session. Uh, I think most people have the assessment that not much is going to come out of it which leaves Pakistan, or Bangladesh, very much in, the, in a situation like a lot of developing countries. Insufficient assistance from the North, or concessions by the North, and probably not much from OPEC. What does a country like yours do then, given the inflation rate, given the world economic crisis? And if you could also follow that up on, what do you tell the world in terms of the things you are doing to meet your own energy needs within Bangladesh? Good, I think that's a very good question. Uh, it's a very difficult problem, let me tell you. But this should not dishearten us. Uh, uh, there should be less of uh, pessimism and more of optimism. And uh, we should move forward and uh, negotiate, uh, uh, carry on with the dialogue, talk and find out formulas which could uh, bring better results in this. As far as we are concerned, uh, we are not sitting idle. Uh, we are developing our natural gas. And we have sufficient natural gas. Uh, I think in the near future we are going to uh, uh, sort of bring gas under more utilization. Uh, we may sell <coughs> natural gas as LNG and use natural gas as CNG and things like that. And uh, we are now exploring ourselves uh, for oil. There's very strong indication that we have oil. And uh, we hope in the near future we may have oil, we may get oil in our country. Uh, then we have a huge reserve of coal. 
in the northern areas of our country and we're going to ex uh, sort of exploit uh, this coal mine. And we're working also on other form of energies uh, to meet our present requirement uh, and, the, and also the future requirement. But uh, as time is passing, our own energy requirement <coughs> is also increasing. So coming around that uh, we got to do something so that the least developed countries do not come under so heavy pressure as a result of the increase in the price of oil. Because we really don't have the means uh, to buy oil at such high rates, yet we need oil for our development. Is, is the oil, fi uh, oil deposits that you have indications of, are they anywhere near this line of demarcation of the continental shelf with India? Uh, because there are some people, perhaps uh, not well-wishers of either India or Bangladesh, who would like to see a kind of dispute coming up on this. I find your questions are one track, however. <laughs> you see, we are looking for oil uh, uh, on the land. We have brought now our own rigs and in a few months time we would be uh, drilling for oil on the land. Mr. President, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today, which is a great pity. It always, the clock always beats us. President <laughs> Zaya, that's, uh, we have to uh, close the show, but we want to thank you for being with us today to answer our questions on this edition of World Chronicle. Our guest has been Zaya Rahman, the President of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. President Rahman here to attend a special session of the United Nations General Assembly or is interviewed here at UN headquarters in New York by Brennan Jones, correspondent for Interpress Service, the Third World News Agency, Peggy Wilkins of the International Staff of the Wall Street Journal, and Prem Shankar Jha, editor of the Financial Express of New Delhi. And I'm Brian Saxton, thanking you for being with us and hoping you'll join us again for the next edition of World Chronicle. Transcripts of these interviews may be obtained without cost by sending a stamped, self-addressed envelope to World Chronicle, United Nations, New York, New York, 10017. World Chronicle is broadcast in developing and developed nations worldwide and features senior officials whose work is concerned with the developing nations of the world. In spontaneous, unrehearsed, unedited interviews conducted by reporters from press, radio and television. World Chronicle is a public affairs presentation of this station. It is produced by United Nations Radio and Television in cooperation with the UN's Division for Economic and Social Information. This is Tina Jorgensen speaking.